Hello, and thank you for attending today's webinar titled How to Integrate Your ITSM and ITAM Programs Under One Roof. I'm Michael Adenovich, the Solutions Architect Manager for Cybersyn. I've been with Cybersyn a little over three years now. I've been in the IT industry as a generalist, if you would, for, oh, probably about 34, 35 years. I'm, I'm aging myself. Uh, so as I mentioned, more of a generalist, but I do have my specialties, those being ITSM as well as asset management. With me today is George Spaulding, and I will hand the microphone over to George, and George will provide a, an intro for himself here. Well, let me keep it. Uh, let me keep it quick. I also have been doing this in some way, shape, or form, though uh, for about thirty-five years. Though I was, uh, I was geekier in the beginning. I was, uh, I was a techie. Uh, you know, Windows trainer, Novell, Cisco trainer, and then moved into this world of ITSM. Actual vehicle was uh, training people in how to do a help desk. So suddenly that led me to ITSM, which led me to being one of the co-authors of ITIL v3 back in 2007. Um, and that's uh, just Suffice to say, I've been with Pink Elephant around 15 years doing uh, ITIL and now uh, expanding into, uh, over the last several years, Lean, Agile, and DevOps. Well, thank you, George. A uh, couple of housekeeping items. This is a non-interactive webinar. So if you do have any questions, please do post those in the GoToWebinar question panel. George and I did carve out some time to answer those questions. Um, so we will get, the, get to those at the end of, uh, again, uh, today's webinar. If you stump us where we're unable to answer any questions, um, we do have your email from the registration and we will follow up via email. Today's webinar is being recorded, so you can view this later. I will post this out on Vimeo in about a day or two, so that this way uh, you can review it uh, whenever you like, or maybe recommend it to a coworker. George and I would greatly appreciate it. To find that, just go out to vimeo.com, do a search on Team Cyberson, and you will find today's recording along with um, a number of previous uh, recordings out there. So uh, if you haven't been out to that site, I encourage you to, to go out there and check it out. It is pretty cool. So with that said, let's go ahead and uh, begin today's session. And we'll go ahead here and advance the slide. Quick agenda. Uh, there's a, a lot of persons that are a little bit unfamiliar with Cyberson, so I'll provide a quick overview. Uh, along with why uh, we're Pink Elephant has joined us today. And thank you very much, by the way, for joining us, George. And then we'll cover inventory, asset, and configuration management, as well as the commonalities, the differences, uh, and why or how they're related as well. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, we'll go into the Q&A. And we do have some demos to provide, so this is not just going to be PowerPoint by desk. So we'll, we'll mix it up a little bit there. Try to keep you interested. So uh, Cybersyn, we're headquartered in San Diego, California. We have offices in London and Australia. Cybersyn started in 2012, providing Microsoft System Center consulting, specifically configuration manager, service manager, and we saw some gaps with those products. And, and we actually created uh, some software to really enhance the System Center experience. Uh, and as of now, we are really a software company and we provide software for service management for asset management, uh, as well as uh, tools that uh, uh, really enhance configuration manager. It's actually a web-based uh, 
uh, interface for Configuration Manager. And we still do stick to our roots by providing uh, consulting services um, still for System Center as well as the Cyrusen uh, products there. And because we are doing service and asset management, we have our solution where it is all a single solution on the same database. That is uh, one of our strong beliefs. George here from Pink Elephant feel the same. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and talk about, uh, um, again, service and asset management living together in the same uh, database there. So with that, I'm going to hand the microphone over to George and we'll let George take it away from here. Okay, so uh, I, what I'm gonna describe now is not, uh, I believe, a maturity model per se, but rather um, that it grew simply out of, in many cases, desperation. In other words, uh, in the early days of IT way back when, we, we started just needing to know what we had. Uh, what stuff there was. In this case, it was always a physical object. These were physical servers, uh, and those might have moved into kind of blade servers and a rack and those kinds of things. Uh, but we were just at the point where we just needed to know how many monitors we had, and maybe it's possible we were even keeping track of keyboards and um, PCs, not laptops, but PCs, and then we moved into servers and those kinds of things. And we needed some, so that that became what you know and love as asset tagging. And uh, boy, it must have been 25, 30 years ago, we started moving into barcodes so that we could do that very easily. And that removed human errors and those kinds of things. Then we started deciding maybe we didn't really care what kind of keyboard you had and what kind of mouse you had, and even what maybe what kind of monitor you had if it wasn't somehow special or unique. And most of this grew out of the uh, desire of auditors uh, to know what basic uh, assets we had. So um, one more click, uh, Michael. So the, the, the concept of, of asset management, just generally without even throwing it into the IT asset management world, it was, you know, born uh, maybe, you know, hundreds of years ago, not quite, but uh, certainly throughout the 1900s where we were basically starting to keep track of assets and, and where people were needing to capitalize them almost always for financial reasons. And we're talking chairs and tables and uh, typewriters and buildings and cars and fleets and, you know, physical assets and things that auditors cared about. And, and, and they cared about the financial end of it. How much did it cost us? When did we buy it? What's a logical or legal uh, amount of time to write off this capital asset? And then do we get to keep using it after it's written off? All of those types of things. And then, of course, in the uh, certainly in the about the 60s and 70s, leasing started to become a big deal. And we started leasing instead of buying capital equipment because it was uh, two things. It was uh, there was no, the barrier to entry was, was small because we were just giving them a monthly payment. We didn't have to pay for it up front. So the use of our capital was better. Also, uh, it because things went out of, out of currency, if you will, so quickly in this world of computers, a three-year-old computer was considered obsolete. So therefore, it was very easy for us to stick with the leasing concept and pick up a brand new one, et cetera. And, th and that, made, uh, that made sense to people as well. So we could keep our inventory current in terms of, uh, of what we were actually using. And at the same time, we'd, we'd, we didn't have, we were able to um, use our capital um, dollars in other ways. I have a story to tell you, uh, which is true because I'm too old to make this stuff up anymore. So I was sitting on site at a client and it was a, the largest, I think it's still the largest privately held company in the US. And because it's privately held, nobody knows anything about it. So 
Um, so I'm sitting there with my contact and he gets a phone call literally while I'm in his office and he says, no, that's okay. You can stay. And I said, okay. So, uh, he said, he's talking to the leasing company and they're calling to give him a heads up that the 30 servers are coming off lease in about 120 days. And how did he want to handle that? And he said to them, well, I tell you what, uh, we're going to buy that lease out from, from you guys and we're going to just keep owning that equipment. The leasing company was thrilled. They get paid twice. Uh, they're, they're ecstatic. He hangs up the phone. I went, <clears throat> so you want to clue me in here? Why would you buy uh, 30 uh, three-year-old servers? Uh, why, why wouldn't you just let them go back to the leasing company? He said, because I don't know where they are. I can't find them. We've looked for them. It's easier. This is an easier solution for me. <clears throat> now, it's a, an expensive solution, but in his particular case, obviously his asset management and asset tagging systems weren't exactly working. He literally couldn't find those 30 servers. So, Okay, so we care about lifecycle tracking, care about the financial elements. That's, that's, and we'll get, we'll get into asset management a little deeper in the next slide. Okay, one more click, Michael. And then we move into this world of configuration management. Now, this first came into, um, to, I don't know, fame, if you will, uh, with the early ITIL stuff that came out in the 90s. So I was talking about a configuration management database. Well, what's different? Why, why isn't that exactly what the asset management database is as well? Well, it, it does differ in what information it holds. It, it includes, we assume, it includes the asset tagging information and the, perhaps even the financial um, attributes. But what, what, it, what was never in the asset database was the relationship between this particular configuration item, which was the name for asset in ITIL, this configuration item and other configuration items and how they interacted together and what together or this one plus this one plus this one made up a system and how did that work and what was the type of relationship? Was it a parent-child relationship? Was it peer-to-peer? -peer? Those kinds of things became important as we moved into this world of configuration management and system uh, service management. So um, that what also became obvious was that the ITIL side of things was much more operationally focused than the asset management side of things. And we're going to talk about that in a little more detail. The other piece of the, of the configuration management was we actually cared about the configuration, whereas what we tended to see within asset management was, okay, what is it? It's a server, uh, who made it? It's a Dell, uh, what's the model number? How much memory, how much this, how much this, that's it. It was tended to be very physically oriented, whereas in this configuration management, yeah, we cared about all of that, but we also cared what the current operating system was, what the rev level was, what the patch level of the virus definitions were. We cared about what software was on it, which version of SQL. We started to care more about the specific operational configuration because that was going to help us uh, with change management and it was going to help us triage with incident and problem management. So those became more important elements. And what we're trying to deliver in this world of ITIL, which is where we started hearing about configuration management, is services. That's what ITIL in the end delivers via a number of pro operational processes. It delivers services. Okay, Michael, let's go with one more. So I'm going to step back for a minute and then we'll get into this bigger relationship. But so what's the scope of, of IT asset management? Because isn't it the same scope as IT configuration management? Uh, I'd like to say no, it's not. That IT asset management is a much broader scope than configuration management. That that while IT may get in on the initial specking of a piece of equipment, um, of saying, yeah, we need a server and we need it to look like this and we need this parameters and things like that. Once they've done that spec, 
Then asset management, purchasing obviously goes out and buys it, but asset management is involved at that point, whether this is deployed yet or not. Asset management's involved in the, the acquisition or the creation in terms of software perhaps, uh, or the acquisition of software. It's involved in uh, at the acquisition phase. It's involved in noting that we own it now or that we've leased it and what its current status may be, which is might be just staged. It's not ready to deploy yet. Um, as, as it moves into a different status, whether this, this asset or this configuration item suddenly is now at the uh, deployed stage, at asset management says, okay, now the status is deployed. Well, that's when Surprise, surprise, that's when our buddies in configuration management and IT ops get very interested in the asset. They really weren't interested in it until it was actually operational and deployed. Um, and then uh, fast forward to the end of the life cycle, now we're getting rid of this asset and we're twilighting it and taking it out of production. Now, He's not that interested in anymore, but asset management kind of reemerges and says, whoa, well, I'm interested in it. I'm interested in it because it has, it might still have financial value. And I'm, my job is to make sure we get as much value out of it as possible. So we could literally sell it to someone else or get a write off by donating it. That would be one aspect. Then the other aspect, another aspect would be uh, data security. So now this server, if you will, or even laptops or anything else, We'll have data on the hard drive that we can't allow into the public domain. So that's part of now disposal of this of this asset. I either have to remove the hard drive and, and have it destroyed and get some certificates of destruction, uh, or I have to uh, be happy with the white uh, the wipe tool that we have, all of that. Then I um, now we're getting ready to physically dispose of something. So what about environmental concerns in terms of the disposal? So, so the, the aspects of, of, uh, of asset management and the scope of asset management is much broader really than the scope of configuration management. And the world of configuration management and ops, once it's no longer deployed, we in the world of IT ops, we don't care as much. Then the other piece of this is what about what about assets that aren't that aren't technically assets? Well, first, there's we we can now have physical assets at a remote at someone else's location. We can co-locate, or we can, in essence, own a box at someone else's location. Or, as you all know, we can have virtual assets, things that are in the cloud. So one of the questions then becomes is, does asset management, you know, kick in as part of that? Well, I think that's, you know, we're going to talk, we could talk a little more about that one in terms of having those virtual assets, which don't really have financial value, it can't sell them or anything, uh, and they, but but they are, and they're technically, I'm buying them by the month, if you will, um, with usually with no long-term contract associated with it. So uh, it doesn't have a financial value, but there's a lot of value in the configuration side in terms of those virtual assets. So we'll talk more about that with the next slide. Hit me, Michael, one more. So, so now we're getting, we're starting to talk about the fact that asset management versus configuration management. And this is where I think I really need to make the case that the asset management scope, much broader, uh, kind of soup to nuts from acquisition or creation all the way to the final disposal or disposition of the asset, whatever that may mean, depending what kind of asset. It's very interested in financial. Uh, its statuses tend to be focused on the entire life cycle. It's, it's, while it's not strategic, it is much more tactical than configuration management, whereas configuration management is much more operational. And asset management is 
it, it is indeed about control, and, and we use this word control all the time, and we never define it. I find that interesting that we say, yes, I have it under control, and we don't know what that means. So under control, when like when we talk about a process in the world of IT service management and say something is under control, what we mean by that is that changes to that asset or to that configuration item are under control in that they must pass through a defined change management process. And that process has um, as its final step, the documentation of whatever change and therefore the update of the asset. So uh, that's what under control means, both in the world of asset management and in the world of configuration management, that we, we can't make changes to the configuration item or the asset without <clears throat> going through a specified process and without documenting that. That's how the, that's really what the word under control means. So as I said before, configuration management, much more focused on operational uh, goals and much more focused on the whole operational end of things. IT ops cares about this asset when it's deployed, when it's operational, when it's underpinning, when it's a component that underpins a system that where multiple systems may indeed underpin a service, which we then offer to the business. And we offer that service to the business so that the business can then uh, put in their own business processes that are completely supported and in many cases totally enabled by IT. Um, that service, which is kind of not physical, and really it's not, it, it may be considered virtual. It's, it, it basically is, is the actual vehicle for value that we deliver to the business is the service. And so we talk about services. We, we talk a lot about processes and those processes enable us to deliver services, which is really the end goal. And the end goal is for those services to deliver value. Um, we care about the relationships in the world of configuration management. So does this box talk to this other box? And this, and, and as you well know, we might have an application sitting on a given server. That, that application requires that three other boxes be up and running and talking to it in order for that application to work well. Think about simply something as simple as a website and you start clicking links and you're actually taking it to other boxes, whether they're on the web or whether they're inside the organization. So there's many times when a, what, what appears to be a single solution is actually uh, a number of different either virtual or actual servers. And so that relationship becomes an important thing to keep track of. What I find today is that we have created and often by accident of a huge web of complexity in the way that our infrastructures are set up. And this is and not because we thought about it, but because we were solving a given problem on a given day and we needed to solve it and we needed to solve it quick. So we made this decision. And then we had to, another day, we made another decision. And suddenly we step back and we look at what we have. And truthfully, to be honest, it, it's a mess. We've got, we have, a lot of complexity and the result of that complexity when everything's working that's great wonderful whenever but when something suddenly isn't working the the triage and diagnosis of what isn't working becomes a huge effort and suddenly we find ourselves in situations where some, where there's an outage and the outage is lasting two days. And the reason it's lasting two days is because it took us two days to figure out what went wrong, what component it was that was actually failing because of the complexity that we've created. Um, usually we can, once we know what's wrong, we can fix it pretty quick. It's the knowing what's wrong part that gets really a little crazy. Okay. One more slide, please. Actually, oh, it's sorry. part of the demo. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, that was great stuff, George. Uh, great, great stuff. And I, I appreciate that. And there's a couple of things there. I couldn't agree with you more. 
um, when you were talking about relationships with configuration manager or management and asset management and, and, and tying that relationship together. And you gave a perfect example with change request and how really uh, that process ties into the asset management piece. And um, I, I just wanted to kind of key in on that. Um, and I'll actually demo a little bit of that as well. And then secondly, to your other point about when asset management, um, when does it start? Uh, and it's really at acquisition. I agree, but I think that IT is part of um, that process even prior to acquisition uh, as well. Uh, so in a sense, acquisition almost starts at a request in, in ITSM. And, and really the two throughout the process are really intermingled. And that's where Cybersyn comes in. And I'm gonna go ahead and do a quick demo so that this way I can show how Actually, the, the, the two solutions work to, or, or the two are actually together within the uh, CyberSense solution. So hopefully everyone can see my screen here. I'm going to log into the CyberSense portal here. And I wanted to, whoop, what happened? There we go. Let's do that again. So we're going to go ahead and log into the CyberSense analyst portal here or I'm sorry, in the end user portal. Now, when it comes to uh, the request for a hardware asset, there's, there's multiple starting points when you think about it. Um, a starting point could be from an end user just requesting a software or a uh, hardware asset. Uh, or it could be from a department uh, manager. It could be from HR uh, requesting an onboarding. Uh, of a user, in which case then there are assets that are being requested, whether they have to go through procurement or not is another question that depends on the organization. And then lastly, you also have uh, organizations that they're going through big acquisitions, whether it come from a department uh, or departmentalized solution, or maybe it's an enterprise solution uh, starting from uh, upper management, or maybe it is internally within IT, whatever the the reason for uh, the request or who is requesting it, the service catalog into the IT department is really your starting point. Uh, this way now you can, from that acquisition, uh, from an asset and a service management standpoint, track all of this request and manage it through the pop proper work throw, uh, workflow in a single solution. So what you see on my screen is the service catalog that most organizations are going to have that they're going to present to their end users. So as part of a overall single solution, you want to definitely incorporate not only um, uh, service management within your service catalog, but also asset management so that this way everything can be tracked in a single solution. So I'll give you a perfect example. I am going to onboard an, a user at this point, uh, a new user coming into the firm. Of course, I'm going to, I can fill out all the information and I'm not gonna go through filling the, the fields out here. I think everyone gets the gist here. But when you're designing your, your service catalog, uh, when you have a single solution that also ties into the asset management solution. So here now I'm actually pulling from not only the service management piece, but also the asset management piece. Cause again, that is part of the onboarding process where now uh, assets uh, can be uh, displayed within the overall solution. How you present that data, the, the fields that you want to ask your um, uh, HR or whatever is all gonna be based upon your, your process there. Um, another thing is, is that uh, from an end user perspective, if they're going to request assets, um, now again, it starts from an IT perspective not from an asset management perspective, 
although asset management is going to take over for quite a bit or um, shortly after the request, then get handed back over to um, IT from a configuration perspective, as George had indicated, then it's gonna go back to the asset team when it comes to the disposal. So throughout the life cycle of that um, asset, it is bouncing between IT, asset a procurement, uh, 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 configuration management, back to the asset management. And when you have siloed systems, that becomes cumbersome. So you really want to incorporate it in a single solution here. So here, it, this is just a very simple request an end user needs uh, some assets. So if they select, for example, a laptop here, um, you know, they can fill out the form accordingly, but then again, pull from the asset management uh, solution. Hopefully you're, you're managing your software licenses as part of that overall solution. So that this way, not only are you looking at the physical and virtual assets, but also the um, uh, uh, intellectual property assets that ultimately you're, you're responsible for. Uh, and again, here now you can display what software is needed that is available through the asset management solution that could then go on to the configuration um, uh, configuration uh, portion or uh, service management, if you would, to deliver these types of services. Now, once that uh, you've gone through and you've gone through the procurement process, you need to manage that asset. I'm gonna log into the portal, but this time I'm going to log into the portal with service management and asset management rights. So we're gonna go up, oh, need to enter the password properly, that would help. So let's go ahead and let's log into the portal here. And now I'm presenting with the service management portal where I can manage my service management aspect, as well as I can manage all of my hardware assets. And so I'll just pick on a particular uh, asset here. This is pulling all my assets from the asset management solution. Of course, I can see all of my assets and sort and filter on them and uh, even uh, search on these assets here. I always pick on a particular uh, asset here. But as George had indicated, when it comes to that asset management solution, again, now this isn't a single solution, but it has all that information that is really key to the asset management team, as well as service management. I'm not gonna go through all the fields here because that's pretty self-explanatory, but I do wanna key in on some of the fields that George highlighted on is who's, who's working with this particular uh, device. Uh, does it have an asset or a barcode uh, tag on that particular device? Where is that device located? Which, you know, as George had given that little um, story regarding uh, that uh, privately held company in that particular lease, you want to be able to always manage that information. And then, of course, it can associate the CI data to that particular hardware asset to look at that granularity, such as the amount of memory or what operating system, you have all that detailed information, as well as, and more importantly, your contractual data. Um, when is this, uh, is this in warranty? Is this out of warranty? Is this a lease or uh, is it coming out of a lease? Is this have a support contract? You want to be able to manage those those key items and tie that to your hardware asset. If I click on the finance tab, again, we need to understand the financial data behind this particular asset, um, especially if you're going to do like chargeback and things of that nature from a cost center perspective. Um, what was the purchase order or invoice? Who is ultimately responsible? for this particular uh, asset and needs to oversee it. Has that asset been loaned out? If it's been loaned out, has it been returned? Again, you don't wanna put your organization in a position where you're, you don't know where your assets are. Um, also, 
when was it disposed of? And if you're going to leverage a third-party disposal um, company, they will provide a certificate to you after it has been disposed of so that this way you have proof that that asset has been disposed of properly and you could plug in the certification uh, numbers and so forth. Another thing that was really key is, is that, and again, this provides the big picture, is, is that this also ties into the service management. So now I can see the ITIL processes associated to this hardware asset, whether that be incident management, problem management, change management, um, all that information uh, can be tied to that particular uh, asset. And so I just clicked on a particular uh, incident here and I could see that that uh, uh, particular hardware asset, I could see all the issues that have uh, transpired with that particular uh, asset there. So very, very powerful. Um, and now if I go here, I just wanna kind of key in on one more point and then we'll jump back. Um, and, and George mentioned this, is, is that you really want to look, uh, and especially change management processes, you really want to understand how those assets are changing. Um, and again, when you have a single solution, you're able to easily track all that uh, information and tie all that together. So here, uh, I'm looking at my um, CRM application, um, I could see what business service this particular change request is going to make up. If I drill down into that business service, I can see all the different servers, software, uh, storage devices, SAN devices, network switches that make up that business service. And I am building that based off of um, uh, a, a single solution. Uh, and then again, if I go to um, uh, the related items, I could see what assets are part of this change management process. And as these assets change, maybe as part of this change management process, that change is reflected in the CMDB database so that now um, everything is up to date and, and current there. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop here and I'm gonna actually hand uh, the microphone back to uh, Mr. Uh, Spalding here. So let's go back here and let's go ahead and I'm going to hand the microphone back to George here to continue on. Michael, I'm sorry, I lost audio there for a minute. I figured out a way to get back in. Michael, can you hear me? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Okay, yes, no, thank no, no, you. no. No sorry, problem. Lo lost audio there for a second. Uh, so, um, so this this last this last couple of slides here, or this last slide, uh, we're talking now about the fact that the real goal uh, in in the world of um, Hey, George, are you there?
Hello, everyone. It looks like we've lost George from a uh, audio perspective, uh, so my apologies there. Um, what I can do, George was going to cover these next couple of uh, slides here, uh, and what we're talking about here really is more on how service asset and configuration management all tie together. Um, within a single solution to really optimize uh, value with a service delivery um, so that this way everything is controlled properly and is managed properly. Um, and having everything in a single solution really ensures um, accurate and reliable information about uh, that asset. Um, and what's nice about that um, is that it, it really involves also knowing what's going on from a ITSM perspective here. So moving on to the next slide, hopefully I can win this slide as well. So some of the goals here from a, oh, there we go. I'm back, I guess. How, how far, did you hear anything of what I said about the last slide? I'm just curious. No, you completely. Oh, God, that, I'm that's, sorry. That's, that's okay. It's, it's all, no worries, George. What I did is I uh, went ahead and did the previous slide as best as I could. So uh, I, I don't want to jump back to that. Let's no, just no, go, that's fine. Let's, right. let's just go ahead and continue with the, uh, the goals here. Right. So the goals are, are relatively simple. The goal is value. The goal is optimal value delivery in terms of the, uh, in terms of all of, all of ITIL and, and lean, agile, DevOps. It's all the same goal. The goal is value to the business. The service ends up being the delivery mechanism, if you will. Uh, so the delivery mechanism ends up being the service, and there's no reason on earth why, from a technical standpoint, this can't all be done in a single database. From a technical standpoint, it's absolutely fine. It would be absolutely, it would be great. What what we've seen over the past is that the tr traditionally finance has hung on to asset management versus IT ops needing more information out of this database. So suddenly we had configuration management and the configuration management database. So those, those two things can easily combine into a single database and a single product. Uh, so I'll turn it back to you, Michael. Uh, well, thank you. Um, and I couldn't agree more by having everything in a single uh, database there? Uh, absolutely. So let's talk about service management and asset management together as a single solution with Microsoft System Center and then the Cyrus and Solutions layering on top. And I'm pretty confident that most, uh, for the most part, all of uh, the attendees today are familiar with the individual components that comprise the system center uh, stack. So uh, I I'm gonna bypass uh, that conversation. I just wanted to um, keep this slide up because I think it, it really speaks volumes of what uh, key points that I want to get across, and that is, is that most organizations under their current Microsoft licensing own the system center stack. Many of you have some, if not all of those system center products uh, deployed today. And now when you deploy the system center service manager product, if you don't have it deployed already, maybe I'll give you a little bit, is a very robust ITIL based service management solution. And when you implement service manager within the system center stack, it truly becomes the heart of the solution because of the dynamic configuration management database or CMDB. And George kind of keyed in on that earlier that the CMDB is very, very important. And if we can have a single CMDB, for both service management and asset management, uh, we're in great shape. So how does this work from, how does this become service manager become the heart of the solution with System Center? That's because of the out of the box integration uh, connectors that are provided with service managers. So these out of the box integrations populate the CMD, uh, CMDB database from 
the system center products such as configuration manager orchestrator but goes beyond that uh, as well as to active directory and to exchange and the real benefit of this integration is is that configuration manager and active directory and exchange remain the authoritative source of data so those teams that manage those systems continue to manage those systems but because of that integration any changes to those systems are dynamically updated within the service manager uh, CMDB. So that when you're working from an ITSM perspective, you're using the most up-to-date and accurate information. Now, Layer CyberSense Asset Management Solution, along with our other solutions on top of this, really provides a single pane of glass to manage both service and asset management. So, and I, I, I know I demonstrated earlier um, the asset management solution and how you wanna capture that financial and contractual data on that asset as well. Um, now, as part of the CyberSense solution, we do provide asset management connectors that allow you to pull in for the most part, any kind of asset management data that you may be uh, managing today, including your financial and your contractual uh, data. So again, those systems we're retrieving uh, data from remain the authoritative source and any changes to those systems are dynamically reflected in the CMDB. And I'll talk more about that um, as I go into a demo here shortly. But I just want to do point out that George and I were talking earlier uh, when we were putting this presentation together on how organizations um, have and manage many siloed systems to maintain this data. And the two shall never meet in those organizations, which really is a shame because it's creating inefficiencies with company resources, inaccurate data, and really increases your cost but it doesn't have to be that way. It truly does not. So with that said, let's go ahead. I wanna jump into uh, another uh, quick demo here. And here, um, I, I really wanna show uh, more on the CMDB and the benefits there. Um, and as I mentioned, you're integrating uh, the solution service manager and populating that CMDB with all of these different siloed systems. And again, they remain the authoritative source of data. Perfect example, configuration manager data. Um, that is capturing all of your, your detailed CI data that George talked about um, within uh, configuration manager on servers and workstations. Well, all that data is coming into the CMDB automatically for you. The same holds true for all the software that's been detected uh, within that solution. From an Active Directory and an Exchange perspective, it's capturing all of that information on your users. But the, the real benefit here is, is that if uh, the AD team makes a change to Active Directory, say someone's name changed, or uh, maybe some hardware was changed on a virtual or on a physical server, uh, and software was changed on a virtual server. Configuration Manager is the authoritative source. It's going to capture that data. But now that's gonna sync into the CMDB. So both from a service management and an asset management perspective, that data is completely up to date. And I just want to point out uh, the simplicity of the connectors here. Uh, one thing that I do want to, uh, to show is, is that um, with the asset management solution, it does provide asset import connectors that easily allows you to tie into uh, the data that you need to manage your assets, whether that be your financial data, whether it be your contractual data, um, maybe your active directory users, uh, or maybe you're maintaining uh, hardware assets as part of your process through spreadsheets and things of that nature. Again, you could import that data in. Uh, it's very simple to uh, bring in that data. And there's multiple ways that you can do it. 
either directly connecting to those systems via SQL, ODBC, or LDAP. Maybe your security teams prevent you from tying in. That's fine. You can pull that data in through uh, just simple uh, CSV or text files. Uh, very straightforward, very simple to map the data to say, hey, these are the fields on the left that are in the solution. These are the fields or the data that I'm bringing in and how I want it to map. Uh, very straightforward uh, process there. Now, uh, another thing that I wanted to uh, uh, talk about real quick, uh, and that is, is that if we look from a, uh, if we look from a service management side, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and log in as a into my analyst portal. So I'm working from a service management perspective. Going into my uh, my portal here, I got to wait for my server to wake up because it's been asleep for a long time. There we go. So I'm logged in, and here it's going to show me as an analyst. This is a work item that I'm working on. This is a ticket, and in this particular case here, um, I could see that Greg has a laptop that's running slow on this uh, particular ticket here. So I can tie into our true control center application through um, the analyst portal. And what this is going to do um, is help assist so that this way I can better troubleshoot this particular uh, workstation issue. So of course I can see some of the uh, the physical information or the summary of this particular uh, device, the memory, disk space, if the client's healthy. Of course, I have a number of actions that I can run to troubleshoot on this uh, device to see where the slowness is running. Um, it, I'm not going to go through all these. As you can read on the, the, the screen, they're pretty self-explanatory. Reboot, shutdown. I could remote control the device, look at the um, file structure on the C dollar share. I could run service or configuration manager client actions and evaluations, PowerShell, uh, a number of tasks. And uh, again, I could look at more additional hardware information. I can see what software is installed on this particular device and see that, oh, well, it could be that Notepad is causing the issue here uh, with the slowness. Now, if I so choose, I could repair that application. I can uninstall that application. Maybe I need to look to see if there's processes that are causing slowness and then have the ability to start and stop any of those processes, as well as any services that are running. I have the ability to stop and start those services as well. Um, uh, now, once I determine that, hey, this uh, particular uh, device, I, I know it just needs an updated software. But before I deploy that software, I now, because it's a single database, I can look in the asset management solution. Do we have a license for this? Can I deploy this? Do I need to procure it? I'm simplifying the process. I don't have to go out to the um, uh, asset management team and delay the process. I'm truly improving service delivery here. So again, I could now just go through and now add that uh, device to that particular uh, collection here. And now off it goes. And now I can easily uh, go ahead and resolve that issue. Another thing from a single uh, database here, and I just want to kind of go through this real quick. And that is, is that um, I'm going to log in here as one of my analysts is, is that in a single solution, now when it comes to reporting, there are numerous canned dashboards. There's over like 20 dashboards, both from an ITSM as well as an asset management uh, perspective so that I can see um, quickly what is going on with the estate both from a asset management perspective and service management perspective. You do have the ability to create your own dashboards as well. Um, again, because it's a single solution. 
And now I just want to kind of tie in real quick. Um, this is the last piece that I want to show. And that is, is that, as George indicated, it's very important to have um, the very important to have reporting capabilities and if you're able to tie your service and asset management all together um, we have a tool called our asset excel tool that ties um, excel into the serve into the solution we know asset managers love and it management love excel so now i can tie into that database and i can easily pull in now financial data contractual data or if I want to, I could pull in hardware and software asset data. So let's say that I want to slice and dice some of my hardware asset data here. It's going out to the CMDB and it's pulling all of the information from the uh, CMDB. And in my case, I want the hardware asset data here. And as you can see on my screen, I have every field on this uh, particular spreadsheet including the status, the type, warranty information, my financial information, where this asset is located at, um, who is ultimately responsible for this asset, um, uh, the cost center and so forth. So now I can easily slice and dice this data and I can say, you know what? I need to know when the assets expired for, for example, 2017. And so now I have all the assets that expire in 2017 and I can say, okay, I don't really care about firewalls, um, uh, controllers, network devices. All I care about are laptops. So now uh, I have all the laptops that expired in 2017. And because we're pulling in that financial data now, now I can easily just go ahead and add up this column and now I see what my refresh cost is going to be to replace these particular uh, assets here. So uh, with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just uh, jump back to the uh, slide deck here. And we are on the tail end. If anyone would like to trial the Cyrusen uh, solutions, um, feel free to um, connect with us at team at .com, as well as visit cyberson.com to learn more. We're more than happy to have that conversation with you. And with that said, let's go ahead and uh, jump into the uh, Q&A. Michael, looks like there's one, one question. It looks like Cyrusen has its own connectors. Uh, between SCCM and SCSM. You want to talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, that's a great uh, great question. Um, actually, Cybersyn is, is leveraging the out-of-the-box connectors that come with System Center to integrate the data from Configuration Manager into um, Service Manager's uh, CMDB. So, uh, we are actually leveraging those that particular uh, connector. Cybersyn does have um, other ways to bring in data because what we tend to find is is that a lot of customers um, create uh, unique fields within Configuration Manager. Uh, they may have modified that. If so, we can bring in that data. We do have methods to do that. Um, and then we do have, yes, our own connectors that can bring in data from just about anything as well. So if we wanted to, that asset import connector literally could be leveraged to bring in configuration manager uh, data. Um, you'd have to understand the configuration manager uh, tables to do that. But the short answer is it can be done. Um, so, um, so it's kind of, yes, we primarily lean on the system center uh, connectors, but we do have the ability to leverage our asset import connector uh, to do that as well. So hopefully that answers your question there, Clay. Um, and okay, uh, uh, it looks like that was the only question. Are there any other questions 
that George and I can answer for uh, uh, for our crowd today. We'll give it a minute in case someone wants to post something because I think we have. Uh, uh, well, we're at the top of the hour, but we'll still we'll still give it another minute here. Um, keep the floor open, uh, and again, uh, if you'd like uh, to reach out to, uh, uh, if you have uh, questions after the fact, feel free to uh, reach out to us at uh, team at cybersyn.com. We're more than happy to, to answer those questions. It looks like we have a quiet audience today. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. George, I'd like to thank you for presenting with uh, me today. I really appreciate your time and uh, I hope that everyone uh, found a benefit with uh, the webinar that uh, George and I put on for everyone today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. The, uh, oh, 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 we have another question. We have another question. Connect to a workflow process for purchasing. Um, that's that's a great question. Um, yeah, this the the overall solution does have a workflow engine, and I forgot to mention that. Um, it is a very, very robust workflow and automation engine within the actual uh, solution itself. However, if you have um, another solution that you're using for workflow management, um, the solution is very flexible where we can leverage that as well. There's many ways that we can tie the two together. Um, we could do it as, as simple as, as an email, or if we wanted to, we could integrate it with uh, our APIs. So uh, the short answer is uh, yes, um, uh, we do connect to workflow processes. Um, how we do that is going to be based on your requirements. So hopefully that uh, that does answer your question there, Susan. Great question, by the way. And um, George, I'm sorry I did kind of cut you off there. So no, my I was just no problem at all. I was uh, I was just going to talk to you, but briefly about the fact that I consider this really an impressive product. Um, I hadn't had really a chance to see the product before we started doing this. So it's um, the fact that you've combined all these elements into basically a single product, single work, single. Um, you, I mean, obviously, System Center is, is at the heart of it, but uh, but the fact that this is all combined into one place gives an incredible amount of power to the actual operations people in IT. So I'm very impressed with that. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, our customers uh, feel the same way. And actually, we have over 1,200 customers uh, in 65 countries across the globe leveraging our products. So I think that uh, that kind of reinforces what you just mentioned and thank you very much. I appreciate that, George. Yep. So again, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar um, and you have yourselves a uh, great, great day. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, George.